uh, I'm Kermit Cole. This is Louisa Putnam. Uh, we've been involved in the Native America project since its beginning. Uh, we're very proud to have been involved in, especially proud of what it has grown to be. And we're also uh, we're also proud to be uh, presenting this series uh, in uh, partnership with the Hope and Dialogue project, um, which is uh, coordinating and promoting research and development of the of Open Dialogue and the Open Dialogue Network, and also uh, Open Excellence, which until recently, or until now, has been known as the Foundation for Excellence in Mental Health Care, uh, which uh, is and I are also involved in. And um, we're very proud today uh, to be with this panel of very uh, esteemed uh, people, and I, I mean that from the depths of my heart. Um, mm -hmm. I have a lot of respect for the Hearing Voices Network and what uh, it has accomplished and what the people here today have accomplished. And I also want to take a moment to recognize that there are a lot of things that we could be talking about today. Uh, there are a lot of voices that we uh, can and should and wish we could uh, be bringing into this room. Uh, but with acknowledgement of that fact, uh, these are the voices that we have here today. Uh, these are the, these are the voices that have been trying to be heard uh, for many, many, many years. Um, and this project is all about making sure that all voices are heard. And so we're lucky to have these people and these voices here today. Very, very, very. Um, and we're also very lucky to have all of you in the uh, in the room. There's 131 people uh, participating in the chat room right now. And the participation in the chat room is an equally important part of what we're doing here today. Um, the space that we're all able to create together to consider the history of the Hearing Voices Network and Hearing Voices Work and to consider uh, what that history has brought into our present moment in the world today. Uh, and our collective ability to reflect on that and build on that is, is the goal here today. And the panel is presenting a discussion, but it's only part of the discussion. And we will do the best we can to bring comments and questions uh, from the chat room into the discussion. Uh, we won't, certainly won't be able to include everything and everyone, but we'll, give, we'll, we'll do our best to at least bring in some representative thoughts and questions. Um, and so with that said, um, I'd like to invite the panel uh, to introduce yourself. Uh, and we discussed uh, already doing that in alphabetical order by first name. Take it away. I guess I'm CA, so I'll jump in. Thank you, Kermit. And thank you all so much um, for joining us today for this town hall. Um, my name is Caroline Mazel Carlton. I'm in Western Mass, a part of the Western Mass Recovery Learning Community. Um, and I'm on the board of Hearing Voices Network USA. Um, you know, I've been a part of this movement for several years, and I think for me, my passion is around building access. So, um, you know, started one of the first groups in a forensic setting in the United States, um, and also one of the first online groups over Zoom um, in 2017. I know those are a lot hotter ticket now um, than they were all those years um, ago. Um, I'm also a Kesher Fellow through the Aleph Alliance for Jewish Renewal, studying to become a rabbi. Um, but most importantly, um, I am a voice here. Um, voices are a current part of my reality. So when I introduce myself, I also like to introduce some of them, at least some of the voices that I'm hearing from right now. Um, so I want to introduce, um, you know, I'm hearing a voice right now, a man. Um, he is angry today, um, but I'm honoring that. I'm going to name him by name. I call him Frank. Um, I'm also hearing a younger 12-year-old um, male voice who's telling me that he's really brave and he wants to climb trees. Um, and interestingly enough, I'm also hearing uh, the voice of a beautiful uh, women's voice singing to me. And she is also singing about trees. Um, so I'm pumped to be here um, with, with my network, with my people, and excited for this conversation today. Mm, thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. I'm hitting it over to Chaku now, I believe. Yes. 
Um, and thank you, everyone. Thank you for this gathering. It's great to be included. My name is Chaku Mathai. I live in Washington Heights, New York City, and i um, been a voice here for 30 years with extreme states of uh, various kinds. And uh, since coming to New York City in particular, started facilitating hearing voices, hearing voices network meetings and part of the movement in my mind, you know, uh, since the beginning, but I, you know, really uh, just so appreciated in this most recent transition in my life, the, the presence of the HBM movement and the invitation, especially for those of us who are people of color in the movement. Uh, it's been, it's been an especially important time uh, to, in fact, Back in the Boston Congress, where when I was invited to, to offer a workshop at that time about how our intersectionality needs to come forward uh, now more than ever. And so the very process of HBN and open dialogue to really make room for all of us and all of our voices, um, but more importantly, to really giving, give us the chance to uh, examine the contradictions that exist in our belief systems and the way we operate on a day-to-day -day basis even within our movements. And I think that's been, been gratifying to see that willingness to, to shift and take off some skin, you know, in that regard, uh, and really learn learn from each other. So I, I, I wanna just say that, and, and especially during this time after uh, the murder of George Floyd, that you know, we, we uh, have to continue and persist in, in that effort. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cynthia Marty Hedge, and uh, I have a huge gratitude to be here. I have huge gratitude to the Hearing Voices uh, movement. Uh, maybe, maybe 11 years ago, my timing is not a timeline is not perfect, but I got to go to a training. Then Paul Baker was one of the trainers, and uh, I basically said nothing. I was on a boatload of Haldol, and uh, my life has uh, dramatically changed since that time. Mm -hmm. I get to facilitate a family and friends group, an HVN group, a very rare idea of a family group that tries to hold HVN values, which is really a counter to most uh, groups offered to families where they, they focus on the identified patient versus uh, you know the ideals of open dialogue. You know, and in these groups, we try to... Uh, have people talk from their own experience, own their own distress, and talk about relationship and dialogue. And I'm psyched to be here, and I'll pass with that. Thank you, Cindy. Who's next? Is it me? Yeah, hi, yeah, my name's Paul Baker. I'm in Manchester in the northwest of England. Um, this is where, in a notional sense, the Hearing Voices movement as an international activity really began. Uh, and it began as a grassroots movement and actually remains to that day. So I'm back in Manchester. I've been away for some years, but I've been back a few years now. Um, like you, um, Marty, I, I've got a group, a family group as well, which is also he hearing to the values of the Hearing Voices movement and looking at that whole perspective, valuing inclusion, valuing dignity, valuing input. Um, and I am a family member. Uh, my brother had voices, um, and I was already a mental health activist back in the day before the Hearing Voices movement existed. And I couldn't find a way to understand the meaning of his experience outside of the site theatric frame and I felt I let him down badly so when I met Marius Rom and heard about the Hearing Voices approach it touched me deeply. I found out around about the same time that actually I am a psychiatrist child. My mother um, was placed in psychiatry when I was very very young, a few months old and I lost her in my life for quite a few months after that. And my brother was born shortly after me also she was still in psychiatric care when he was conceived. So we feel also that we are um, very much relating to the whole psychiatric hegemony and that its power over our lives and how it's determined through labeling and pathologizing human distress has destroyed the quality of our lives and the futures that we could have had and the ones that we need now to reclaim. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, bro. Hi. My old ears are wanting people to speak up a tiny bit, if that would be okay to ask. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Ro. I'm from New York, the Lower Hudson Valley, um, coming from the Mental Health Association of Westchester. Um, I have history of voice hearing, and wow, I'm just so grateful to be a part of this conversation. I know that a lot is happening in the world, all over the globe. People are trying to express their truth, be it on racism, prejudice, discrimination. So I want to honor and acknowledge all of those individuals who are maybe not on this webinar, but hopefully working towards, you know, some better understanding of us all together globally. Um, because I feel like globally things are happening. It's not just isolated to one singular event. Um, so like I said, I have history of voice hearing and the way that I came to becoming a, a hearing voices uh, facilitator um, as well as a peer specialist and also currently doing peer supported open dialogue with Cindy Peterson Dna at um, MHA of Westchester. I came into it from one of my first hospitalizations, starting from a very traumatic event of not knowing what was happening to me, hearing multiple voices and being, you know, not even being told what was happening. Um, the the team at the time that was at my one of my first hospitalizations basically told my diagnosis to my mother and it was my mother over the phone that told me what the team had defined as my experience um so of course i was devastated i took on every single stereotype um about my personal identity from being removed from any clear understanding because giving just having that diagnosis didn't really clarify anything for me and to have you know quote the professionals not even have a conversation kind of just made me have had to find my way through the process so fast forward um around 2016 i want to say um i was trained um, by the great Caroline um, to be a hearing voices facilitator. And that really was when I started to reclaim my narrative and also reframe my sense of self-identity. So I'm really excited to have conversations today with everyone. So thank you. I speak. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah thank you. Sorry, we got put on mute. I've been thanking you all after you spoke so much. But... Oh. Rufus. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm Rufus. Uh, I work now in the system in the role as a psychologist, um, and I try and promote uh, a different approach to perhaps the mainstream approach and try to be promote collaboration and curiosity and um, see meaning in people's experiences and try and find new ways to look at with people at their experiences and learn from them. Um, I, I was attracted to the Hearing Voices movement in 1999. Um, and I'd had my own kind of extreme states when I was 18 and I was, uh, and I kept quiet about it. I got diagnosed with schizophrenia and I, uh, and then I managed to get away from the mental health system and I trained as a psychologist. And then the actual forum I found was a Hearing Voices Network style conference and uh, to, to sort of bring those two different parts of me together, the helper and the mad person. and um, and I was really, I really felt embraced by the hearing voices movement that, that, and and that was a real relief because I hadn't found spaces like that before. Even though I wouldn't identify as hearing voices 
I did I did get messages from the TV and things, but I don't I don't define myself as a voice here. But I I'm really inspired by uh, their whole ethos and find a lot of common ground. Um, so yeah, and I've been involved with hearing voices groups more or less since then. Not quite since then, but for about the last uh, 19 years, been involved with hearing voices groups, support supporting them and um, facilitating. And, um, things like that, uh, and, and very interesting dialoguing as well. So how you can change relationship with people, but and also voices through dialogue, through uh, courage and support, getting enough support to have a peace, have a peace, um, a peaceful parlay. That's me. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and it's great to be here. Thank you, Rufus. Thanks, Rufus. Uh, I commented, I made a note uh, when we first all met that uh, really one of the, for me, uh, a key moment in my relationship to all of this was seeing you speak, seeing you, Rufus, speak uh, in Wales uh, about, um, uh, in response to uh, the idea of evidence-based practice. And you, you were saying there's another kind of evidence, there's the evidence of testimony. Um, that may have a profound impact on me, you know, just that phrase. Uh, I keep it with me. Um, so we're all here to give testimony uh, today. And this will be an unfolding discussion about uh, how we have been using EE forms uh, in the world, what it's taught us, how it has prepared us for the time that we're in today, and what we're learning today uh, about how to bring voices into a safe space. Uh, and also, uh, we're in a world now where a lot of people are realizing that the kinds of, you know, a lot of people who have been isolated uh, now have a lot to offer. Uh, a lot of people who have been marginalized and uh, haven't been heard have a lot to say uh, to people who are experiencing the world in a different way. Um, and I would say, uh, this may, is a little risky to say, uh, because of course, in some ways, we're all very limited uh, by the, you know, the formats and the context in which we can connect now. But at the same time, there are some opportunities, some differences in the ways that we're connecting now that are perhaps new and different than we've had the opportunity to do before. Um, and the, the ability to get uh, networks, gather networks and get people into a space where they might, you know, where people who hadn't felt equal now have a chance to feel equal uh, and that sort of thing. Um, so I guess I, I'll just put it out there to all of you. Um, what have your experiences been coming up till now? And During the COVID time. Uh, before well. before yeah, the COVID before time and, and now. If it's all right, I, I have a, a thought on this one. Uh, I was uh, in a hospital. I was on a COVID floor. I was in isolation. And the uh, the fact that I had been in this hospital before in isolation, but on the mental health floor, now I'm on the COVID floor, uh, it just brought back all these feelings of, of being isolated, of being disconnected, of what does care look like? And my hopeful side thinks about now there's a vast society world that's experienced isolation and disconnection. You know, and, and maybe there might be more empathy. People have lost some meaning and purpose when they, they can't do the job that they used to do. Mm -hmm. so the isolation that I've experienced as a voice here, you know, maybe now more people could uh, identify with what that feels like. To think of uh, being locked in a room is called treatment. And, you know, then now these other people who didn't sign up for it, didn't get diagnosed with something, didn't uh, agree to it, have been isolated as well in their deep distress. And so that's just one thought I had. And thank you for letting me share. I love that thought. Um... I was reading today that there's a lot of um, observations that 
um, within the mental health system, more coercion is being used at the moment. Um, and uh, under lockdown and under um, you know tighter security, and but it, it seems to be also associated with more coercion being used. And, and I really like the message of hope that yeah, maybe the public will be more, more curious about the impact of isolation and more more sympathetic to the different forms of isolation. And yeah, let's undo it. Let's say this isn't a treatment. <laughs> yeah, I want to just come back to address this issue of values and, and, and this idea that's fundamental to the Hearing Voices movement, that we are a human rights organisation and where that came from. And, and since the title is also reaching back right to the beginning of the beginning of the Hearing Voices movement, where it came from, I mean, it could so easily have been today another institute formulated along the idea that we found and discovered an idea that could become a treatment and it would have been extremely hierarchical and we would have all been wearing specialist labels and I would be who knows what in this in this other world. But as it was, we 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 ourselves at the beginning of the process of understanding why hearing voices as an approach was important was because before we heard about the hearing voices approach, most of our activity was oppositional about banning ECT, about ending coercive treatment. And this time also remember um, it was the closure of the big hospitals, the psychiatrists where, where abuses were so extreme. Um, that the alternative of so we learned a lot but what we did we we were rooted in the civil rights human perspective and we were standing on the shoulders of people going back to the early 60s from patients unions mental patients unions and uh, people against psychiatry and we were part of that vibe um, however what we didn't have was something if you like more constructive to put into it to challenge that increasing pathologization of human distress within biological psychiatry that was already still an energy, very powerful energy. We even without the big institutions, what was going to replace the institutions? Meds were going to replace the institutions. So you can imprison people in their head, you know, rather than having manifest uh, large hospitals all over the place like we did in the UK and I know in the USA too. But the issue became. Um, how are we going to organise this kind of idea? And we rooted it in the understanding of a kind of sense of challenging psychiatry and the roots of psychiatry. And we connected up with democratic psychiatry. And I came across this document that we put together where we understood ourselves as a collectivist. It's a, it's a, it's a little document where we had a meeting with the uh, people from the Italian democratic psychiatry movement. And... Uh, we found out you could run a mental health service as, like they have in Trieste, in Northern Italy, without locking doors, without even having a hospital at all, and without using all these coercive practices like ECT and shutting doors in people's faces. So we knew this was a reality. Uh, so we travelled there in a minibus from Manchester to Italy. This is like going across halfway across the USA. A group of survivors, a group of mental health activists, and we've tried to learn from them and also critique them. And as a consequence of that connection, we ended up at this conference where I met Marius Ron. And he liked what we were doing and saying, because we rocked up as a survivor kind of energy. And what the first thing we did was take down the antipsychotic stand that was being used to, which was in the hall. So we had an action and we tried to make, you know, so this is, this is not the way. But again, as I said, it was oppositional. And what the Hearing Voices idea offered was a counter narrative to pathology that this actually was human faculty and experience that had meaning. And that meant a lot for me, not only in a, as an activist, but also in terms of my lived experience, my, my experience of living with my brother through this kind of unusual extreme experience. So it, I think it's really important to understand that we came from somewhere. And part of that input and influence came from the United States, from the Ruby Wax Center, from Boston, from, from the early days of the survivor movement states. And we connected up. And that connection, I think, is, is the strand that we've strengthened and grown to. Uh, and now in the UK, we're reaching back to your energy and your radicalism and trying to reintroduce that back here. So it's a good, it's a good bouncing ball going backwards and forwards and all the way around the world 
and bringing energy from Brazil and from the rest of, you know, all parts of Europe, but really looking to our diversity. Um, that's, I think it's important that we frame it in that way. Mm -hmm. Paul, if I may ask a question. Um, uh, I, it's... You see me? Yeah. Hello. Uh, uh, what have you done? Because I just Kermit, we can't really hear you. Uh, what is, maybe I should rephrase that. What's, what's it? Um, Can you hear us now? Yeah. Are you frozen? Okay, so I, yeah. Ker Kermit, I think you're frozen. So I'm wondering if Ro or Chaku, I, I certainly have thoughts about this, um, you know, HVN in this current world. I know that you haven't gotten a chance to respond yet though either. So would, would one of you like to share your thoughts while the tech is sorting itself out? Sure, I mean, you know, in response to HVN, I mean, like I said, I came into, you know, being introduced to this way of thinking, taking on all of the stereotypes, all of the social uh, judgments and, you know, perceptions of someone quote, who is having alternate states. Um, and I felt shame and I felt devastated. I felt like my humanity was robbed. So I do feel like having an alternative framework to not necessarily um, take something external from oneself and apply it to their lives, but to find something internal and to connect, have the opportunity to connect to that internal relationship with our inner dialogues that is not pathologizing, that is informative and healing and positive. I think that HVN definitely gives that space and is about offering an opportunity for another narrative. Right. Um, so that's really, you know, what comes to mind. And I think, you know, in the spirit of us speaking also about open dialogue and peer supported open dialogue, I think both really are aiming, especially peer supported open dialogue to bear witness with families and individuals about what their interpretation of what they're going through is and what their agency about whatever their process is. Um, so I'm very excited. I think that it's very necessary to have these spaces. Thank you, Ro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really resonate with that because, so for me, like, like at the end of the day, what this movement is really about is multiple realities, more than one reality, different encounters with reality, all being real and valid. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that validity, um, which stands in contrast to our current society, where it's like people in power set the reality um, and where the pharmaceutical model has so much um, power. Um, but my ancestors and many of our ancestors lived in a world where there was interpretation, um, where there was communication with other forms of consciousness. And so for me, like things are really hard right now, but I'm hopeful for 
these values of honoring multiple realities to bring us through, because I think that's what, you know, we're looking at white supremacy. And as a white person, I walk through a different world. I experience a different, a completely different reality um, than a black person in this country um, or a person of color in this country. The reality is different. Um, but acknowledging that and with deep humility, listening to people about other realities um, is how we're going to shift things. Um, and so I'm feeling like as stressful as things are right now, like, oh, my God, like when COVID hit y'all, um, I think U.S. was the only one doing Zoom groups. So we were like the Ellis Island. We were like the Statue of Liberty out in the harbor down where Chaku lives. Like, give me your tired, your poor. Um, come into our Zoom groups. And um, I think it's expanded a bit now. Um, but, you know, it's been exciting to bring people together. And I'm excited about how this rootedness in many realities is being valid can shift things. Um, and yeah, you know, our HVN USA, our charter has been explicitly anti-racist, explicitly anti-trans, um, you know, against transphobia. This has been included in our charter since July of last year. Um, and so there's been some really powerful conversations within HVN values of, you know, I'm seeing white white voice hearers in these groups really like building their understanding um, and these values holding some of the challenging conversations that need to happen like yesterday that needed to happen 200 years ago, but they're happening now. So, you know, I didn't hear the question itself. So is there some can you restate it? It's just like how, um, you know, in this era, like originally it was COVID-19, um, but we're seeing so much more that we're dealing with broader, like any experiences you've had with your voices or supporting people within these values that you want to share with our group today. Yeah, I appreciate what Will and you have already shared on that. I think you know, I, like everyone here, you know, my experience emerged in a certain way that no one else around me could explain. Every explanation didn't jive with what I was learning from what was happening. So um, I had voices I trust. I, I, had, I had experiences I, I hated. I had, you know, states that I didn't want to be in and states that I wanted to return to. Um, there was an inner world that I just could not um, make meaning of. And an external world that it seemed to have some kind of reaction to, uh, and maybe that I was supposed to have some kind of purpose in, but I couldn't find that either. So, yeah, maybe as 16, 17, 18 year old person, I shouldn't have to figure that out, but I was being forced to in a way that I didn't really have anyone around to explain that to. So, I, I the system itself, being caught up in the system and having to be diagnosed and be informed and you know, I have people kind of tell me and others in my family, especially being Indian, I'm, you know, born in Kuwait, we have a lot of different ways in which we interact with the system and ours was basically to reject everything, you know? And so I think that was actually one of the gifts of my process that I had at a time in the mid eighties when everyone else was kind of being swept in. My family was willing to hold off and kind of push back and say, no, no, we're going to, we're, we're willing to go back to India or Kuwait or wherever we have to go to get away from this because we don't want to see him secluded and restrained like we saw him. We don't want to see him in the hospital like we saw. We don't want people talking to him the way, the way they're talking to us as people with, you know, in denial or neglect or ignorant. And at the end of the day, eventually the people that, that supported me were very different. Some were Indians. One was a guru from India who, uh, in Sri Vidya, you know, a um, in, a, in a tantric community. Another person was a fellow uh, 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 person diagnosed with with a psychotic disorder, and his personal experience was a guide for me as well because I didn't want to go through what he was going through, and he was telling me how to avoid that. You know, so there was that kind of. Experience. So anyway, 
the thing that I wanted to say, HVN, just like Rose said, and you said, this, is, this has been the space where I could unravel all of that with some and open dialogue principles are the same, I mean, basically with some room, you know, to actually explain the complexity, the complexity of that um, with the big feelings and the rage and the, you know, because I've got everything from an angry mob that screams that I got to put police tape around to forgive the terrible analogy, but to young, you know, little children waiting to hear a story. That's kind of the, the you know, and then that, that's how they turn to, that's how they, that's how they become when I tell a mantra or an Indian story or, you know, find the things that actually work for me. So anyway, I just, I guess my voice didn't get forged or, and I didn't discover my voice in this process without that space. And so that's why I'm grateful. What you said really resonated. Um, you know, one thing that stands out both from Chaku and Caroline is this notion of like discrimination. I feel like in the psychiatric community, we get discriminated against. And I reflected a lot during this period, like, what am I really feeling? And I can't necessarily say I'm feeling anger. I think from my heritage and all the generations that have come before me, I think about my parents protesting for the Black Power movement, you know, and before them, my grandparents protesting for the beginnings of the civil rights movement. And before them, my great grandparents coming from the South, from sharecropping um, opportunities to, to the North. To me, that's a semblance of protest, looking for something different. So I'm grappling in this time period with all of this history, all of this, these attempts of making change and what flows through my blood is that I need to find a way to make my mark for my generation. And what does that look like? So I'm asking myself those very difficult conversations. What does that action and stance look like. Yeah, that's awesome. And like so much, you know, when I hear open dialogue and I hear, you know, what you shared so powerfully um, and what number of people shared, what comes to me is like, can we bring our ancestors into the dialogue? Like, can we have an open dialogue, um, including that history? I hear the voices of my ancestors. Sometimes that can be a great comfort um, in Jewish practice, we call out to our ancestors like a few times a day, but like other times there's this deep pain and sobbing and, um, you know, can I engage in that dialogue and are there practices I can reclaim practices that weren't encouraged by psychiatry that can help me like hold that. What's so coming to mind to me is, um, when we talk about uh, discrimination, marginalization, there, there's layers, right? So when I get this heavy duty mental health diagnosis, you know, now I'm marginalized that way. But if you take it a step back, who gets diagnosed with what? Right there, you see the, the huge discrepancy based on race and gender and uh, what is going on in the political atmosphere, you know, is somebody paranoid if they're getting harassed by the police? You know, to look at things in the social context. Uh, so much of a psychiatry can be blaming the victim, right? You know, within HPN, there's this premise that if you look closely to the somebody's life experiences, their voice hearing experience is going to make sense in some way. And, and that's what I like to say, you know, it's not just an uh, individual problem within Marty. You know, there's a context, a bigger context that these things are happening in. And to, to give voice and not to be immediately uh, discredited because there's, you know, someone decided to diagnose you. And, you know, I think it's also kind of funny, you know, I can go and I can get lots of different diagnoses. And how come the people who can't agree aren't getting discredited? credited you know 
I am, and they can't even agree on, on what they want to call this. And uh, fortunately, my last psychiatrist told me, you know, my diagnosis was I'm a human being, you know, and, and trying to navigate life. And and that was a, a, a diagnosis that didn't marginal, marginalize me. But yeah, I think we have to look at all the pieces of who, the whole, the whole stuff about the Instead of chemical imbalances, power imbalances, and trauma. Thank you for letting me share that way. Paul, your mic's off. Do you want to share? Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I just wanted to make this inner, this inside thing and the outside thing about voices or the experience of psychosis, or is it schizophrenia? When I, when I look at open dialogue, I see they, they frame it within the mental health world, really. They use words like schizophrenia, and they use, and they are kind of like treatment as an intervention, as a sense. But it's, it's dealing with the external reality that the person or the intervention is for the network as a whole, not particularly focused on the person who might be experiencing psychosis, whatever that is. Um, do we agree <laughs> on what we're talking about? Uh, or even using the labelling that that is used within the DSM. But in a sense, they, they, they I get the got the energy that within the open dialogue to make movement forward. They wanted to do that because it establishes them within an evidence base and it allows for the treatment to be rolled out through services. We took a very different approach, which was to say this isn't about a treatment. This is an approach, and the approach is I diverse, holistic, eclectic, and they belong to people. It can be. It's associated with transformational, transcendent, spiritual. It can be earthly. It can be all of these things. So I suppose the challenge to, for me, in terms of the content of the voices, why they arose and what, what their meaning may have in our lives, um, for me, you know, like my brother's voices also belong to me, I feel, in a sense. So you know, it is my part of my history as well. Part of my, why don't I hear voices, I, ask, I often ask myself. Um, you know, or am I? Um, and I'm not listening. So, so the point I'm trying to get to is, is that we pay a lot more attention to the inner experience. What is it for you? And what, what, what do you regard it as? And what is the relationship that you have with your experience? And I was wondering how that way of working interconnects with the dialogic approach with respect to the community or the network around the person. And that to me is a really interesting question. I'm not sure I know the answer. Um, yeah, I feel like, you know, with dialogic practice, you know, I know open dialogue, you know, really jump started shifting the paradigm from, you know, the identified person being separated from their families, you know, and bringing everyone in the room together. Um, I know from co-training, you know, at the Mental Health Association of Westchester, peer support of open dialogue is that we're committed to hopefully doing that very thing that you're speaking of, Paul. It's like bearing witness and ha bringing that voice into the context of the larger social structure um, so that polyphony and all vo voices are heard by not only the family, but by the individual and also supported by a peer in facilitation um, so that symbolically and also in contribution, the peer is contributing to the dialogue that's occurring within the social network. Um, and I think that that really is such an important element as open dialogue expands into many things. Um, and I understand and totally respect that there's many views out there about the role of peers being involved with open dialogue. Um, and I wanna respect that, but I also just wanted to say that for me, the experience has been having a peer perspective be a part of those conversations on a social, systemic family systems level can be very powerful to have everyone in the room all together with someone who also has had lived experience. 
Well, I love, I love what you guys are saying about community because we're having this conversation about policing. And, you know, I've had the police, I've gone to jail. I've been like beaten by police um, for the simple fact that I was acting different. I was hearing voices that were calling me um, a murderer and I was yelling at them like on the street um, and kind of some of them were coming out of me and I ended up in jail. And so, you know, broader than just open dialogue, there's like this idea of like community versus cops. Like, why do we have this culture where if someone's hearing voices, often people's first reaction is to call the police. Like it's happened to me. And um, I think because of white privilege, I'm still alive, but there's a lot of people that don't survive those encounters. So I love the idea of bringing in peers but I'd also like to see, like, as my ancestors would say, the whole shtetl, the whole village involved taking back our human right to stories and listening to one another um, and supporting each other. Um, because that is what humans, I think, deep down want to do. They want to connect. wanted to take a turn at Paul's question as well. That, you know, I think this, Caroline, that was great. Will, as well. I mean, I, the, you know, the, for me, I felt like most of my interactions earlier on, especially in, in the most disrupted times of my life, I was interacting with the perceptions of everyone else, you know, and I was constantly discovering, had, feeling like I had to figure out what your perceptions were, what your construction was, what, and then dismantle that in order to make room for me. And that was, that was a constant experience. And, and learning how to, how to integrate, you know, both the messages I was experiencing about those perceptions. So someone is, you know, thinking this about me, this is what they're planning for me, this is what they're uh, doing to me. Um, some of it came out of fear, no doubt. I think my perceptions, my trauma dri drove that. Like, like many of us here, I've, I've experienced a lot of, lot of trauma. And that certainly influenced my, my perception of what other people were saying and doing. But at the same time, I needed to figure out a way, and, I, and this is what I'm still practicing today, to, to make room for, as Carolyn said it at the beginning, make room for the perceptions that other people are experiencing you know, the thoughts, feelings, perceptions, as well as my own. And that's what Open Dialogue and Hearing Voices Network has really created an opportunity for. And, and, and that, you know, process has actually helped me heal some major relationships, especially with my family, um, has helped me. And I, I referred to taking the skin off. I wanted to kind of explain what that meant earlier. Like I have a, a tattoo of a snake on my skin. I was very drawn to snakes as a, as a boy. Part of it is because of this thing that they can do, which is to take off their skin. You know, it looks like it's painful. They have to rub against trees and rocks and things. But I equate that with the removal of a belief system. And I had to, that's how hard it was for me to remove the belief that my parents were trying to kill me, which is what I had a fixed belief about for 20 years. And that kept me safe, no doubt about it, to, to ruminate on that and to stay with that. But to let it go meant I had to believe that they loved me, that other people cared about me. I had something to contribute, that there was some purpose for me in my life. And that what they were saying to me, maybe I still disagreed with it, you know what I mean? Or even the way they live in or whatever it is, but now I can move forward with who I am in a way that I didn't think was possible in this world, you know? And then when I need to retreat to the inner world to discover myself again, I can go do that. It's just like taking off the skin again. Snake doesn't just do it once, it has to do it regularly because that skin grows back. You know, and so that's that's what I that's my process, if you will. I go into the ocean beneath the waves, take off some skin, come back up to be raw and vulnerable with you again. Thank um, you. I, I'm sorry. I just wanted to, you know, thank you, Chaku, for that. That was a great visual, you know, and I could actually feel that you know, as I heard you speak. And I just wanted to thank Caroline. I mean, I think you really 
touched upon something that hopefully is in the spirit of all of this, which is remembering the humanity. Um, Because at the end of the day, we all are human beings. Um, And no matter how we're being in that humanness, um, hopefully we have context where we're allowed to understand and connect to that humanness. And I think really at the end of the day, it's about validating, like you said, Caroline, that humanity, um, hopefully. Thank you for speaking to that, Ro. And Chakru, what you shared about like that belief with your parents was really powerful um, and touched me. I know, Rufus, you've done a lot with you know, HVN is not just voices, right? Um, it also includes, you know, belief systems um, and the lens we view the world. And I'm wondering, Rufus, you've done such incredible writing on that that I've personally benefited from. If you wanted to share on that or anything else. Yeah. Um. Yeah, well, I've been. I've got all these kind of different voices, stories, listening to people, trying to listen to people, and trying not to um, get too confused with what my all the different stories I'm also thinking about. Um, yeah, I, I guess the, the great thing in the Hearing Voices movement was this idea of like, that we accept different realities that you mentioned, and that uh, we try to create a space where People in a group might value biological ideas of mental illness. Other people might value, or the same people might value spiritual ideas. Other people might value psychological ideas. And that we try to respectfully dialogue about these and, and take what we find useful. And, and I guess how we sit alongside and be curious, I guess I've always been interested in that. That, that I believed I was a spy when I was. 18 and and sometimes I still feel like a spy and 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 sometimes that's helpful and sometimes it's actually not very helpful to think I'm a spy <laughs> um, but because sometimes I need to uh, forge alliances more alliances than the spy by um, uh, working in the better health system and, and, and I need to dialogue with people I actually disagree with fundamentally uh, and and the spy doesn't want to do that and the spy wants to just subvert <laughs> um, so, so yeah, and because I know that that, that belief would, had value for me, it, it, it gave me a sense of purpose and meaning in my life to believe I was a spy. I, I, I kind of deep down know when people tell me about their beliefs, no matter how bizarre they sound to me, that, that there, there's, there's, a, there's a method in the madness. You know, that, that it seems mad to me, but there, there's this... You know, it might be protective. It might give meaning. It might give um, symbol symbolically really represent some powerful emotions. And and so trying to honor that, I I don't know if I'm always able to. As but on a good day, you know, really be walking alongside someone and really trying to understand and and listen and empathize and and together. You know, sometimes. They'll challenge me and I'll challenge them on our different takes on reality, but it's a very respectful approach to trying to move away from that kind of top down. This is reality, guys. Get with it. <laughs> Which we, I had that in a ward review, you know, the doctor saying, last week you thought you were in a church. Do you now know where you are? You know, and it's like, get with the program. You know? and, it's, and, and that's a top down approach, trying to move away from that. and and and. There's parts of me that want to tell people how it is and trying to hold, bring them back a bit. <laughs> yeah, so um, groups have been good places for me to learn more about those skills, really, of, of respecting different realities, different perspectives. The idea of respecting different realities and uh, just having curiosity. You know, you know, I don't have to agree. I may not even understand. Frequently, I don't. And so I, I jump in there just to be curious. How does your world work? How does that belief system work? How's it working for you? 
you know, and I'm somebody who has gone through different ways of seeing my experience. And frequently I see that in hearing voices groups, but that's, that's really, a really important to respect somebody's uh, self determination. You know, I, I can remember having somebody tell me what this particular, uh, I was seeing a crying baby and I had somebody tell me what it meant. And, and, and I, you know, it took me longer to come to that conclusion for myself because somebody else was telling me what it meant. You know, and if, and if instead they had approached me with curiosity, you know, I might have gotten to that point sooner. So it's not important whether uh, I know what's going on with you. It's important for you to figure out what's going on for you. And, and the idea that we all hold so many of our own answers. And another gift that HVN gave me was it told me I needed to become the expert on my experience. How could I expect somebody who sees me maybe 20 minutes every six weeks to be the expert? You know, so it's a, a really different kind of model to actually, instead of deny and tear down, to actually embrace and examine the experience the person's having. Thanks, Cindy. Rupus, I loved what you said about your spy um, and getting to know that part of you um, and his need to, I guess, subvert, but also like it sounds like I'm not interpreting your experience, but have an impact on the world. And I'm wondering, so Louisa had had a question before we began that I think is kind of related to this um, about angry or violent voices. Um, sometimes in our movement, we get accused, I've heard this, like, you romanticize the voice hearing experience, whatever that means, like, I love romance. But I've also heard voices that have told me to kill people. I've heard voices that have told me to kill myself. And I know what society says about people like me. And so my HBN journey has also been one about making space for anger and that anger could be meaningful. Um, you know, that these voices that were telling me to kill were also begging me to make something different. Um, so now like studying to become a rabbi, like I'm looking at things like sacred rage. Um, like sometimes there's this bias that you hear about like, Jewish practice, like, oh, your God is angry. Well, you know, our, you know, creator is like everything, but anger is there. But what if that's okay? <laughs> like, what if it's okay? And I feel like it's so timely now because our streets in the United States are full, I think, of this sacred anger, the anger that demands um, shift and change. And so there's so many lessons that I've taken from HBN, you know, but also like the world around me, my tradition to finally make space for those voices that are adamant um, in wanting things to be different and often use this metaphor of death around it. Um, so I've lost a lot of shame around those voices. I'm just curious um, if other people had experiences around this topic that I think is often of interest. Like, what about those voices? Um, so I'll, I'll take a turn and get out of the way on that. And one, I, I just want to start by saying, um, you know, going back to what Cindy and Marty were saying around the examination of it, I, that that's just one of the areas that if, as a person of color, especially as a young man of color, in, in the 80s, in the 80s, when it was very zero, we had a zero tolerance kind of environment for any kind of um, big feeling. You know, so there was those of us who would immediately get put into more of a disciplinary process at school and separated in some respect. And there were those that would get help, you know, and get support. Um, I was uh, very, very aware of the consequences of showing what was really going on. And so the ability to speak in code, I mean, so hip hop, for example, was an example of the way in which many of us spoke in code to each other 
about our rage in a way that was understood between people, but not revealed to people in control. And, and that was not going to change for me for a long time. I, I, I needed to keep an arm's length relationship with their, you know, and I still ended up caught up, right? Whether it was in the system or criminal justice or in handcuffs or whatever it might be. So even with, with the control I tried to present to myself and with the relationship that I tried to have with the many messages inside of me um, that told me all kinds of things. I, had a, I have a lie detector in my head. I have a, uh, I'm a defender. I have a protector. I have a, a lover. I have a, you know what I mean? I have a lot of different perspectives that help me navigate. And now it's down to like one voice that I really trust. You know? But so I, the relationship had to become one that I, I had to be in. I had to be like, okay, thank you for being my advisor. My godfather actually in India one time after I went through this huge thing, it was in 1998, I'll never forget it. And he just told me a story and just said, look, you got to remember, you're the king. Everybody else in there is an advisor to you. You take it in, and you decide whether you want to open that gift or not. You don't have to accept every gift from the village. And he kind of reframed everybody's kind of relationship with me in that story by just saying, look, you get to decide what the next course of action is, not them. And when that happened, I really learned how to, it wasn't just suddenly done. I had to practice and I'm still practicing how to bring my, my voice of truth, which is oftentimes, you know, burning with, you know, not, there is no light without something burning, right? So that truth is oftentimes burning. But love is what, you know, kind of brings that a little bit into focus, you know? So I try to ma manage my voice today. My, the voice that comes out of my mouth is one that has both love and truth in the same voice, in the same sentence. Not two separate sentences. Not like I'm going to say something truthful now and then I'm going to say something loving next. But what is the sound of my voice when it brings those two together? I know the sound of my voice in handcuffs. I know the sound of my voice in restraints. I know the sound of my voice in angry. I know the sound of my voice hitting somebody. You know what I mean? I know those sounds. But can I discover that new sound? That's where I'm at. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Chaku. And, you know, in regards to, to violence, I think that, you know, once again, we're in a culture, we're in a society where violence is automatically thought as being negative. You know, something that needs to be handled, controlled, regulated, you know, you get put, you know, in restraints or, you know, isolated from the rest of the community or hospitalized if you express any thoughts of violence. So I think, you know, for me personally, I mean, I definitely had a couple negative voices, you know, that were very persecutory, very, very negative. But you know, I've actually put myself in danger several times following what they were saying, but that's, that was a part of my process. You know, I don't want to give it a good or bad, or, oh, you shouldn't have done that. That was my truth. You know, that was where I was in relationship to those voices at the time, you know, is, is that I, wanted to follow them and I believed in what they told me. And if it happened to be, you know, to be angry or to feel, you know, senses of violence, um, I feel like we don't give enough space in this culture to hold on and explore, you know, with the larger community and support those states that we might find ourselves in you know, be it with voice hearing, be it with our own inner anger towards people, places, and things. So that's what I really am always disheartened by is that there's not a communal space to express safely our thoughts and feelings of violence. Totally, because for me, like when I can't express them, it's like they just build and build and it like feels like so much more powerful. I mean, that's why roller derby was so helpful for me and my voices. Um, I've got my Memphis roller derby uh, shirt on. 
um, because it provided this container for communal expression of big feelings. Like, I think I did get punched in the head this game in Memphis. Like, those girls were were pretty tough. Um, but it was helpful oh. for me because it, like, it gave honor and space to my inner world. Yes. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say I had a voice. Uh, I've had a number of voices who talk about violent things, but uh, when I was 12, I had a voice that was very loud uh, telling me to kill my mother. And uh, I knew I was not going to kill my mother. That was not on the table. But, you know, I might fantasize about it to quiet the voice. I might self-injure to quiet the voice. But uh, what that voice was doing, as I understand, looking back, was it was trying to get me to defend myself. You know, that, that you know, I was being physically abused and I was taught to honor my parents and uh, all that. And so this voice represented my anger. And it had to get loud and it had to get provocative for me to defend myself. And, and eventually I did. And it totally changed my relationship to my mother. And I think about, you know, if I had gone to school and said, I have a voice telling me to kill my mother, what would have happened? You know, would, would somebody had actually looked at the whole family system? I don't know. I, I'm kind of, I don't think so. I think I would have gotten labeled and medicated then. Um, and, and I had this great gift, you know, 20 years later of telling a therapist about, uh, you know, telling my mother, if you hit me, I'll hit you back twice as hard and all the shame and guilt I had about hitting her. And she explained to me, well, that's when you quit getting hit. I'm like, what do you mean? And she's like, that's the thing. That's when children stop getting hit is when they hit back. And so. Someone might say that was an awful voice I had, but it had a message. And it had a message that I needed to hear. It just had to get really loud and big for me to hear it. Well, I mean, as thanks, Molly. As as we're witnessing, you know, in the news, we live in a very violent society. You know, I watched a, a program last night. Uh, about 20 murders on that film, you know, last night. And so that's that's a big part of our vocabulary subconsciously. And so, you know, voices, where, how we want to define them, are going to use that if they get frustrated. And often we're trying to kill voices, you know. Society is trying to get rid of voices. They, um, that's the culture we live in. You know, this the hearing voices approach is not mainstream. <laughs> Um, and so uh, I've learned a lot from aggressive voices, uh, working with people with aggressive voices. I've realized the need to help people, you know, embrace their warrior, um, find ways to express it. And, and, and I've had to, through that, I've learned to express and work with my warrior. I took up boxing. <laughs> and I use a lot of boxing now in, in the psychiatric hospital, pad work, we've got punch bags on every ward um, and a lot of staff doing pad work with people. Um, and, and there's no, it, it's very taboo actually, that, that's quite rare. Um, so yeah, I think it, it's something that people are very scared of and that it shuts down conversations about the meaning of voices, that fear that tabloids, newspapers have, have you know, highlighted. The, the, the aggressive voices, but there's so much wisdom here in what's been said you know, that we need to negotiate assertively and compassionately with these voices. Um, that's what hostage, you know, negotiators do. The first thing they do is understand, try to understand the uh, hostage taker. And um, we just need the rest of society to get that. I just wanted to say one more thing on that topic. So, Rufus, I really appreciate that, what you just said. So, I'm, you know, just my own experience has been that I experienced a lot of violence as a very young person, starting school all the way you know, into uh, teenage years. 
And it wasn't until actually that violence stopped that voices came in. And um, it was, an, it, I didn't really make any connections to that in the way that Rufus described, for example, I, you know, I didn't realize that there was a relationship that, that an aura, or a, a, a warrior within me that I was needing to necessarily engage. Um, but I, but I knew that I needed to unlearn some things about how to how to operate in the world, um, and I didn't I didn't know how I, I took I took I blamed myself for all of that longer than I needed to. You know, if there was an environment that you know, like what we're creating now for each other, that didn't blame me, but helped me understand the context in which I was experiencing all of this. And then uh, move forward. Yeah, it doesn't take the rage away necessarily, but it certainly um, would have helped me and my family kind of be able to talk about this in a way. I wouldn't have had to keep it, keep it secret, you know, as long as I did, um, and then give it more power in that way as well. So uh, what a powerful thing for society if we could all want that. But, you know, I, I, anyway, that's all I want. I, mean, I, I, the, the, I just can't, I don't want to under-emphasize or under or minimize the the, the force or the drive the driving force that violence we might have ex have experienced um you know and it, that it, that it, that it kind of creates right so you know i, I, you know, I don't want to you know uh, cause you know, any any bad feelings you know i've been i've been beaten with a baseball bat by kids because of the skin of my you know color of my skin so so that doesn't go away that, you know, in terms of the meaning that that made when I see other white people. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah, I think that speaks so true to me, uh, Chapu. Um, you know, when I go back to what I said about my, you know, my parents, my grandparents, and my great grandparents, you know, I don't necessarily know the anger. Um, and the violence, you know, you know, particularly racial violence that, you know, they had to confront, you know, migrating from the South to the North um, in hopes for a better life, you know, only to find out that, you know, it's a systemic issue. You, even if you're leaving the South and coming North, you know, surprise, <laughs> not, you know, not much is gonna be that different. So, I mean, this generational or kind of like, um, you know, transformative sense of anger and violence that kind of transforms through time is interesting to me because I don't know the, the anger of my great grandparents. I know, you know, the anger that I'm confronted with today and the exhaustion more than anything else. So it's transformed within my heritage. Um, and I think that you really speak to that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and a theme I've noticed, and it's also a theme that people are curious about in the chat, people have brought up ancestry and family. Um, and we've got about 15 minutes left of this awesome conversation. Um, I'm wondering if people want to speak to that more. I've seen like questions like, what do family members do? Um, like what should family members do? And, you know, in my own family, um, you know, because they're, you know, in this country, there was such this value in assimilating, um, and getting that white privilege and being professionalized and so in my family, there was this real attachment to the medical model. Um, and the medical model has so much power. Um, and that attachment in my family introduced this like even bigger power dynamic between me and my parents. And it was like, it was so hard to connect across it as like the person in the family that was labeled as mentally ill. Um, and to this day, like I, you know, this is a hard story to relate, but you know, I got married. Um, I just celebrated my wedding anniversary, but when I got married, 
um, a family member said to me, please don't have children. Please do not have children. Um, you know, because you are mentally ill and so is your husband. So your children would certainly be mentally ill. Like that's how science works. <laughs> so that was said to me and incredibly difficult thing to hear. And so I'm curious for other people, like I, I wish I could get my family relationships back from the medical model. Like I wish that we could have had like, um, you know, some of these more uh, equal conversations level the field, um, you know, because I think a lot of people are asking these big questions about like, why do I suffer? Why does my child suffer? What is the meaning of life? What is happening? How do we get through this? And then the medical model swoops in to answer that and gives these like ridiculous answers like genes when there's like not even like great evidence to support it. And it like, it robbed me of, I think a lot of the relationships I would want to have. Um, so I'm curious for other folks that want, I know there's people here who have done incredible work with family members of voice hearers. Like what insights do people want to share in this time? I'd like to come in on that one. <clears throat> um, I was a mental health activist before I knew that my mother had spent a year in psychiatric care whilst I was um, I was a baby, and um, <clears throat> because of the shame that the, in in my parents were went through the Second World War, they were blitzed in the city of Birmingham shortly after my father became a, a, a serving, you know, he he became a life service man in the in the forces in the armed forces <clears throat> my parents moved to a, a village miles from anywhere they they were used to living in large family groups they were separated from that my mother couldn't cope she probably had what we would be regarded as um, postpartum psychosis or something you know she was given ect like hammered it into her I didn't find out until I was 27 and I found out at a wedding where an aunt who was looking after me for that period of time I was separated from my mother told me, did you know that you live with me? Well, how would I? It could be secret. I was really angry about that. I was angry, first of all, with my parents. Why don't you keep the secret? But I became more angry with psychiatry, actually. And also, I think that it's interesting. It's not so much the genes that continue. It's the psychi psychiatric abuse that can resonate through families. It's another example of that kind of transgenerational, intergenerational thing that goes through families, <clears throat> and I'm sure my family has issues. You know, we have we have stuff that we we are we are dealing with, and I'm dealing with, and I, my children are dealing with. <clears throat> so, in in relationship to the challenge in front of us, I think that it's a big question for both family members and for workers. You know, what you're doing here, and what you what do you want for yourselves. <clears throat> so, in my hearing voices group where we're, we're working as family members, it's very much about our needs and understanding our relationships with, with respect to um, what's going on, but also our role in the person's life who might be in services, because most of the people, that family members that I'm working with, I've got people who've been in services six years, eight years, living in difficult circumstances, facing incredible challenges of being over-medicated, loss of liberty, under Mental Health Act legislation, no freedom, no agency, no autonomy, and they're dealing with that, and it's killing them. It's killing the families, it's killing the mothers, it's killing the fathers, it's destroying them. And, they, and, and the people are ready, you know, they're ready, I believe, to hear something else, another story, another possibility, which is bounded in hope and the possibility of change. And we are part of that movement that says no this is no longer good enough i may not understand but i can stand with you i can stand with you thank you so much paul um it's amazing how things can happen in different places in the world and have some similar uh, themes so in the family groups that i'm a part of yes the challenge to uh create a space where a parent can actually talk about their needs and their thoughts and their fears. And to really look at, you know, when someone says to me, my child was in crisis, I'm like, what does that mean? 
And a lot of times what it means, the parent was really afraid, you know, and they weren't sure what to do. Um, so this idea of examining what, you know, a, as a parent, what are, what are my beliefs? And I, and I, and the horrible thing of it in the U.S. and I assume other places is, you know, you're a bad parent if you don't make your kid take that medication. That you will be, you know, found as uh, neglectful if you don't cooperate with psychiatry. You know that. So right by the, the get go, we're setting up a trail. You know, and these huge power plays, and uh, you know. Even if you are the one person your child trusts and they know that no matter what you love them, you are now in this role where you're creating harm in their life. And you're just trying to pick what is the least harmful thing I can do. Uh, so, but basically what uh, a lot of what we talk about in our groups in terms of relating to, to your uh, loved one is to talk about mirroring back strength and hope. Hope, like you said, Paul. Th these are groups where we can actually give hope versus diagnoses and prognoses. We can say there are people who navigate through these experiences and, and create lives that they really are happy about living. That doesn't have to be this uh, purgatory sentence. You know, that's what I got. You'll be on medication your whole life. You'll be lucky to have moments of times, you know, brief moments when you're not in an institution. So we have a totally different uh, message to parents, but ultimately, you know, can you partner with your loved one? Can you accept their journey as their journey and your journey is yours? And uh, and I'll, and I, a big one that uh, took me a very long time to learn was uh, I have to take care of myself first, or I can't be present to help anybody else. And rarely do parents have permission to do that. There's all you want to talk about shame and guilt. It, it gets heaped upon parents. And um, so, uh, Caroline, thank you so much for that question. I'm going to take a turn at that also, although I'm not working with families directly, and uh, Cindy and Marty, by the way, I'm also hearing and seeing some real validation of what you were saying there on the chat. You know, and for me, though, I want to take it back to at least for my family and you know many of us it is an international movement many of us who are people of color there's an ancestral story there that oftentimes for my family that needed to get retold you know? and so the stories that we're telling ourselves and that they were kind of responding to me even from were stories that were driven and written rewritten to be patriarchal from matriarchal they were rewritten to honor hierarchy and royalty and other kinds of things and caste and you know you know these kinds of uh, formal ways in which we were controlling each other. So the messages of how we operate are so embedded, you know, in that way that the only way I could find myself, if somebody needed to tell my father, because he'd be like, "I know we're good storytellers, but why is he telling so many stories? Why is he telling that story? He's not telling the story the same way we tell the story, or the other, you know the." I, because I had to retell the stories. I had to tell them in a new way for them not to be oppressive, you know? and and for them to actually give some freedom. So, so for my daughter to know that no, Chakapuruko Chaku means the next. You know, I'm the the house with the mill. I'm the one that's supposed to be leading. I don't need another man for that now. My daughter's going to be the one to do that, and she knows that. She claims that. You know? Um, so that's the kind of change I think that has been hard for us to talk about as a family, in the extended family, my, my immediate family, my brother. Anyway. Yeah, our, our, our Hearing Voices group um, started off quite a few years ago um, just for voice hearers, you know, and anyone else you had to work hard to visit. but. But as the group has grown in confidence, different members now actually, but the, the group's changed and, and now we welcome supporters, you know, whoever uh, the group, you know, we always put it to the group, but the group welcomes. So we have husbands, um, partners, daughters, sons, friends. Um, and we see that really working because 
often if some because the whole philosophy of the group is about accepting voices and if the if your context doesn't accept your voices then people don't usually come to the group for very long you know because they're, they're just pulled in two different directions so we need to educate the wider network um so i think paul once uh, told me that you know the hearing voices wasn't a therapy hearing voices movement was based on community development and it was about education empowerment and networking and I, i've held on to those three things and keep challenging myself to make sure i'm trying to do them <laughs> yeah that just for the family members i'm a big fan of non-violent communication like it's really good for owning but it, it, you know it's it's one model i'm not saying it's going to sort everything out but i found it really helpful particularly with family members to try and respect our different needs and negotiate together so I, i'd recommend a course on that because that, that can be a really helpful self-awareness tool and empathic tool i had to learn how to be empathic definitely <laughs> especially as a parent when i want to say have you got a job yet So we have about uh, three minutes. Uh, you know, unfortunately, Louise and I uh, got disconnected, uh, and when it came back, it felt wrong to interrupt. Um, You're all having such a splendid, splendid dialogue, and in the chat. Yeah. Um, so, if, does anybody have any final uh, reflections in the last two minutes? I just wanted to check whether there's a recording and whether it'll be made available. Well, unfortunately, uh, a good chunk was lost when we got disconnected. Uh, we restarted uh, at a certain point, but it took a while to get reconnected. Yeah, and but you can, you will get the chat and also the questions, and we'll send you for sure. They, we'll we'll post what we have on the Madden America Town Hall. Yeah, and we we can put the you know, with all of your permission, we can put what we have up on YouTube. That's okay. Um, Last yes, you're you're muted, Paul. Oh, uh, Rufus, Rufus, you're muted. We can't hear you, Rufus. I get confused between mute and unmute. Um, <laughs> one one thing I've just been there for me because of um, Black Lives Matter. Thinking about that these last this last week, and um, I feel really privileged, you know, as a white middle class man. Um, the, the four people I remember from hospital, two of them are dead, you know, and they're both black. Um, I know that my privileges has helped me be here, be this spokesperson and just wanted to honor, you know, Paul Christian, who, you know, he was completely over medicated when he was dying of cancer. And that was violent. You know, that's the violence we don't hear about. Uh, 1,200 milligrams of chlorpromazine uh, and no counselling for the fact he was dying of cancer. You know, and, and, and that's the kind of his camaraderie, his friendship inspires me and, and makes me want to, you know, reach out and, and try to do a little bit to challenge inequalities in the system, especially around race, class. Yeah. Mm. And the, and the other inequalities. Thank you. Final, Sorry, final I questions? probably talk too much. No, not at all. I wish we had hours and hours more to be together, all of us. We're just at our signing off point, but any any last words, any more that, I mean, I know there are so many. I just thank everyone um, to be a part of this conversation and hopefully to contribute meaningfully. It means so much just to be with everyone and the larger global community that joined us today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep, we're all, we're all, our hearts are united in that feeling. Thank you all. We um, so appreciate you all. Thank you. Bye, thanks. Bye.